What is woke? What does it mean to be woke? You might, for instance, hear in the news that a DA somewhere has decided to downgrade the severity of punishment for property crimes, or that a police department decided to stop releasing mugshots because it might result in racial bias, or that a school district welcomed in drag queens to eat the children, or that a university decided not to use the word women because it's exclusionary, or that a clothing brand has partnered with a clinically obese influencer to model skimpy underwear. Oh goody. You might hear those things, roll your eyes, and mutter to yourself, that's some woke nonsense. But how are those things related to each other exactly? Well, think of these things as tentacles of a colossal squid. These far-reaching tentacles may intrude into all areas of life, but share in their base a singular head. This head is the ideology, the worldview, and the movement of the woke. In a single sentence, wokeism is the universalization and mainstreaming of critical theory, a school of thought once relegated to the fringes of social science. If critical theory is the husk of a vehicle, wokeism is the motor engine that gives it mobility, or the former the blueprint and the latter the construction. It is an ideology, a worldview, and a movement premised on the belief that our worldly outcomes can be explained to the exclusion of other explanations by power structures and imbalances, that history explains this structure, that such imbalance results in current oppression of less powerful groups by the more powerful, that criticism of the latter by the former is a necessary condition to the liberation of the former, while the criticism in the inverse, regardless of the truthfulness thereof, perpetuates the supposed oppression. The belief posits that there exists systems of oppression existing wherever we can categorize groups of people into discrete categories race, gender, class, religion, disability status, and nowadays in the popular discourse, body weight. And the central tenet of this ideology holds that these systems of oppression are interlinked with one another. And as such, those who find themselves in the category of the oppressed on multiple dimensions face different and harsher reality than those in the category on a single dimension. They call this intersectionality. And since these systems of oppression are interlinked with one another, the ideology holds that there should form a coalition of the marginalized. Racial struggle is trans struggle, is women's struggle, is indigenous struggle, blah blah blah. The structural lens I mentioned through which the woke ideology tends to view the outcomes of the world forcefully rejects the notion that these outcomes may result from individual differences, rejects that different groups of people, men and women, and people of different races, have real intergroup differences that yield disparate outcomes at the group scale, and instead insists that such disparate outcomes could have only resulted from systemic disadvantages leveraged against these marginalized groups. By systematizing every issue through this structural lens, gone are the notions of free will. If criminals loot a department store, it's because society made them that way. They're a product of their environment. Poverty made them do this. And the woke ideology teaches that since some groups are oppressed, we need to empower these groups to upend the status quo. A status quo with which they take issue because of the presumption that it must have resulted from something going awry. Power comes, they say, from uplifting and creating space for marginalized voices. Empirically, that is doublespeak for silencing those that disagree with the whole premise on the grounds that they are not of the group that the ideology bestows the crown title of the marginalized. If they are of that group, then they're just sellouts, says the woke. Let me clarify, these isms and phobias like racism, sexism, Islamophobia, homophobia exist and that some people display hate towards those who are different than them. Human beings, like other animals, have always tended to form in-groups and out-groups, and human beings, being more enlightened than animals, should come through millennia of painful lessons to reject hate towards one another on the basis of these differences. The questionable premise, really, is that these phobias and isms harbored by the individual has a structural underpinning that is programming this individual to harbor these views, or that these phobias and isms are systemic, meaning that disparate outcomes from some of these groups result from a system keeping them down. And finally, the woke ideology teaches that it, this is a fact of life and the objective reality, when in fact it is a lens, a distorted one, through which one views the happenings of this world. Now, I talked about the head of the colossal squid, the tentacles, the isms, and the phobias, or the purported systemic persistence thereof that the woke decry as evidence of an unjust world. They flow and diverge from a singular head, the brain of the operation, and the muse to the whole symphony. The brainchild of the woke ideology, as it turns out, is the abject rejection of Western civilization. Woke people believe that the West is the root of all evil. In their worldview, Malevolent forces of racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, transphobia, all these isms and phobias coalesce to uphold the oppressive power of the ultimate in group and the face of the Western civilization, the straight white man. In the highest echelons of our institutions of higher education, ideologues need history, like a doe, to link heteronormativity to settler colonialism or imperialism of the West. Trickle down through the generations, the young Westerner of the woke persuasion nowadays proclaims that the West invented racism or that Fat phobia is grounded in white supremacist norms of what it means to be fit. 
the underlying theme in all of this is that the West is to blame. Now, I find several problems with this worldview. For one, it distorts history and present reality in the same at the West. Take an example of heteronormativity, the idea that our society and institutions are structured to have cisgender and heterosexual people as the norm. You might be bemused to find out that heteronormativity, according to some, is something that the West invented and exported to the rest of the world. Take this quote. Societies across the world acknowledged and celebrated gender diverse communities until the British arrived to impose their Victorian values. In crafting this narrative, they'll find, for instance, tribes from parts of the world who had practices that these ideologues retrospectively construe under a set of biases as evidence of gender norms that differ from those of the West. Two spirited people have always existed, they say. This is arguing the rule from the extremes. What you'll actually find in the typical case across humanity is that as civilizations emerged in different pockets of the world, there came to be an understanding in most of these civilizations the distinction between men and women, and from there followed gender roles. These cross-cultural distinctions that emerged independently from one another had no influence from the West, and in fact emerged before Western civilization. But the distortion doesn't stop there. It also blinks present reality to argue that heteronormativity is a Western precept when in fact the opposite is the truth. You'll find in no part of the world do gay and transgender people have greater protections and social acceptance than they do in the West. You might find it puzzling, for instance, when activists superimpose trans colors on the Palestinian flag at a protest, or when feminists here have a hard time denouncing the treatment of women or gay people in the Middle East. But see, to these folks, it makes sense. First, as Westerners, they cannot criticize the way of life of non-Western peoples. Moral relativism pervades when a society suppresses the rightful instinct to defend the superiority of its values. And because supposedly trans justice or gender justice is interlinked with anti-imperialism, so on and so forth, they believe that if these places harbor views regarding gender that is in diametric op opposition to the views they hold, it's still the fault of the West. They explain it away by saying, oh, colonialism made these countries this way. I don't know. Were there any other explanations to account for the fact that heterosexual people were considered the norm for most of human history? Could be the fact that most people are straight, a heterosexual relationship is required for the propagation of the human species, and usually civil societies across cultures order themselves according to the pattern of the majority. If there are alternative explanations that are at the very least plausible, it is often the case that your explanation is not one of fact, especially if that explanation conforms to the prevailing social vision. And this applies to every explanation of a given phenomenon through which the woke ideology ties said phenomenon to a larger system at play. Consider the wave of legislation that the woke decry as evidence of racism or transphobia. Emblazoned across the walls in my law school is the quote, the law is unknown to him who knows not the reason therefore. Could there be any other reasons why people support voter ID laws or laws restricting gender reassignment surgeries on minors? Or is it solely attributable to racism and transphobia? Because if you think that, respectfully, I happen to think that the way you're perceiving things is being distorted by this lens. Here's another problem I have with this worldview. It's along the same lines. It promotes faulty assumptions that are now so deeply ingrained in our discourse that calling them into question invites controversy. Here's the most important one, that these outcomes are solely attributable to an inequitable system. I've heard a lot in academia and in public discourse the following sentence. Studies by people who wanted to show a certain outcome from the get-go show that blah blah is disproportionately impacted by blah blah. This is evidence that blah blah face systemic disadvantages. Therefore, we have to craft our public policy to remediate this harm to, to blah blah in the name of equity. It's a circular proposition that disparate outcomes is evidence of systemic oppression and systemic oppression explains these disparate outcomes. There's zero tolerance in these spaces for honest considerations vis-a-vis -vis other variables. So let me just say one thing on this point. There are real intergroup differences with regards to men and women and people of different races. Differences relating to attitude, behavior, and culture. In my opinion, these differences scaled group-wide result in disparate outcomes. It may not be the only cause, but it is a contributing factor, and my instinct is to say it's a major one. Stereotypes are an accurate reiteration of group characteristics. It doesn't mean that all, or even the majority of the members of a group exhibit a given characteristic, or that members of other groups can't exhibit that characteristic in question. Rather, it means that one group exhibits that characteristic in greater proportion to that of other groups. It is morally repugnant to stereotype individuals who are not acting like the stereotype. At the same time, enough people within a given group do conform to the stereotype so as to produce a group-wide outcome consistent therewith. And this outcome, unfortunately, includes how that group is perceived by non-members. I think this is a better explanation for how a given group is perceived by non-members than, than this invisible hand system that programs people to think certain things about certain groups. But to a person of the woke persuasion, this is the ultimate taboo. 
they cannot acknowledge this truth because to acknowledge this truth would be to repudiate the premise that the disparate outcomes we see today between men and women or between different racial groups result from a system. They'll say stereotypes are wrong, inaccurate, they result from cognitive biases which reverses cause and effect. I don't buy it and neither should you. They'll say it has a harmful impact which I'm sorry but that has nothing to do with the truthfulness of the existence of this variance or whether this variance has a an impact in the real world. These are untruths that the rest of us are collectively being forced to accept because some people can't handle the truth. And finally, this is my biggest problem with the woke ideology. It's reaction to criticism. The reaction is visceral, as would be natural if you operate under the premise that if someone else holds views different from your own, it is problematic, oppressive, and evil. The belief system is quasi-religious. To believe in it is to be a good person, and to question it is to be bad. It narrates the happenings of the world as one of good versus evil. Questioning the orthodoxy is harmful. It is an act of verbal violence, they say. Blah blah is harmful and divisive rhetoric opens marginalized peoples up to violence, blah blah blah. You get the point. Oh, so your view is is that the core of this this right then is about what? So um, I want to recognize that your line of questioning um, is transphobic, <laughs> um, and it opens up trans people to violence by not recognizing that. Wow, you're saying that I'm opening up people to violence by asking whether or not women are the folks who can have pregnancies? So I'm one, I want to note that one out of five transgender uh, persons have attempted suicide. So I think it's important because of my line of questioning because so we can't talk about it because denying that trans people exist and pretending not to know that they exist. I the opinions of the marginalized are beyond reproach as the sacred words of a deity. How dare you question the lived experiences of people who suffer from systemic oppression? There are no questions allowed as to whether those under this radicalized belief that they're being oppressed may have a warped perception of their personal interactions with others, or as we like to call it, lived experiences, and no question allowed as to the phenomenon in which this victim narrative gives those who espouse it a form of social power in dictating how we discuss important cultural and political issues, leading to the fundamental question of how then are they oppressed? Spoiler alert, people who are actually oppressed, and there are actually oppressed people in this world, none of them in the West, don't have the leeway to go up to their supposed oppressors and scream at them on how they need to do better on their oppression and how they need to check their privilege. They can't. They're they'd be too scared to, because they're oppressed. No offense, but this oppression is all in your head and you're living in an inverted reality. And of course, like any good quasi-religion, it imposes swift and harsh punishment to the naysayers and the heretics. You're a racist, the ultimate label of disrepute, not because you discriminate against people on the basis of race, but because you don't buy that these disparate outcomes result from a system, or notice that there are these real intergroup differences. Or better yet, if you believe all that, that is discriminating on the basis of race. We're gonna assume that you're racist in how you interact with others. That's stupid. You're a sexist if you think that there is some value to traditional gender roles like chivalry or the irreplaceable role of a mother in a child's life, or that likewise disparate outcomes don't result from the patriarchy. And of course, like any good religion, this dogma has generally agreed upon rituals. Affirmations indicating your undying adherence to the belief system. Prayers, if you will. I acknowledge and embrace the diversity that exists within all communities and the formative influence that the Washington Heights community will have on my future as a physician. Past and present failures of medicine to abide by its obligation to do no harm and affirm the need to address systemic issues in the institutions I uphold. I vow to use this knowledge to uplift my patients and disrupt the injustices that harm them as I forge the future of medicine. With gratitude, we, the students of the University of Minnesota Twin Cities Medical School Class of 2020, our institution is located on Dakota land. Today, many indigenous people throughout the state, including Dakota and Ojibwe, call the Twin Cities home. We also recognize this acknowledgement is not enough. We commit to uprooting the legacy and perpetuation of structural violence deeply embedded within the healthcare system. We recognize inequities built by past and present traumas rooted in white supremacy, colonialism, the gender binary, ableism, and all forms of oppression. We commit to promoting a culture of anti-racism, listening and amplifying voices for positive change. We pledge to honor all indigenous ways of healing that have been historically marginalized by Western medicine. You might notice that among certain social circles, including in elite ones, 
it has become fashionable to kick off an event, especially a ceremony, by declaring an homage to the specific Native American tribe who were once the owners of the land on which you're holding the event. This past year, I went to Harvard's commencement as an invited guest, and they started off with the we honor and celebrate the so-and-so tribe whose ancestral homeland was standing on. Who's we? Seriously. I, I don't mean to offend. It's just that these kinds of tributes invariably tack on this normative undertone, and I don't subscribe to this agitprop notion that we're on stolen land, or that we must now worship at the altar of those whose ancestral homeland was conquered, in, in a manner consistent with how any land on any corner of the earth was conquered. In the same way that I would object to them starting off with a prayer. I have objections to these rituals being par for the course as if we all agree on the premise. You might say, oh, what's it to you? It's no skin off your back. But it's a, it's a principle thing. Why is all this shoved down our throats? Why do we have to go around in a circle declaring our pronouns? You are forcing your religion onto the rest of us, and just as I would object to a religious zealot doing so, so too must I object here. You might point to your benevolent intentions in behind these rituals, well, so what the zealot? Now, I don't say all of this to disparage woke people, but rather the belief system that distorts the way its followers view the happenings of the world. I have people in my life who are woke, friends I had made when I was woke, and this has led to many difficult conversations once I departed from the belief system. Nevertheless, I love them, I care about them, and I have no hesitation in saying that they are good people. And from what I observe, it seems that the progenitors of this movement were the same ones who made it culturally unacceptable, or at the very least made it be frowned upon, to be racist to others or to harass gay people, and that's a good thing. I think it's fair to say that that is solely the doing of the progressive movement. But what we're talking about here is entirely different. And I still want to say something to woke people generally, and that is this. You are the power. In your minds, there's this existential threat. The oppressive forces of our society convene to create this life or death situation for the marginalized. It is this very viewpoint that leads you to conclude that you are David and your opponents are Goliath, but this is not true in any empirical sense. This worldview is the dominant ethos of our time. It is the culture. Those who oppose it constitute the counterculture, and they are punished for it. This culture predominates our civil society, our academia, our corporations, the media, our government, all levers of power and influence. You are the power. And I would urge the members of the power to cease reacting to those who oppose it with such viciousness as one does when one launches ad hominem attacks, tries to get people fired, smears their character, and, and, and the like. And finally, I want to tie it back to what I said earlier about the woke ideology constituting an abject rejection of Western civilization. I want to mention, I'm a product of the East. I was born there, raised there, came here as an adult. I happen to think that the primary onus is on the children of the West to forcefully defend the legacy and values of the West. To be honest, I defend the East if it came under attack from within by those who don't identify with it. And in fact, I think that in this century, as the center of the world's gravity shifts eastward, and we see a corresponding barrage of criticism levied towards the East, Asian Americans may have a role to play in the rhetorical defense of our ancestral homelands and highlight the subconscious envy that undergirds that criticism. Because that's what I suspect a lot of this is. But although I'm a product of the East at the same time, America is my adopted home, I live here, a lot of the people I love live here, I like living here, and I'm thankful for the opportunities that I would not have gotten otherwise. And the wokeness being shoved down our throats is so annoying. So I'm going to speak up and tell those who oppose it, hey, defend the legacy of your ancestors. There's honor in that. Let me be clear. That does not mean glossing over gross historical injustices. There has been atrocities of epic proportions, hypocritical misapplication of claimed universal values, exploitation of other peoples, and drawing of borders of countries far away that have resulted in ethnic and religious strife that continue to this day. To defend Western values is not to apply rose-colored glasses and viewing the history of Western civilization, quite the opposite. It's having a bit of perspective. It is to expound that, yeah, there has been historical oppression, but it's the very concepts devised and invented by the West, equality before the law, and individual liberty from state intrusion that thwarted these injustices. The same injustices like slavery and caste that pervaded all of humankind. In defeating the evils of slavery, a practice that happened in all corners of the world, the West had to face up to the inconsistency of this practice with celebrated Western thought. In fact, it was the first of civilizations across the world to come to this conclusion, despite what the ideologue with the PhD in ethnic studies is trying to tell you. And in fact, in every landmark case where the Supreme Court struck down de jure racial discrimination, it appealed to the ideals set forth in the Constitution, written by some of the founders. Ideals unrealized at its inception, 
but it was nevertheless these ideals that ended state-sponsored invidious discrimination. These ideals were the first of its kind. To defend the legacy of liberal Western values is to defend its inventions like the use of warrants, procedural due process, and a government of, for, and by the people. These were values successfully exported to other parts of the world and should be celebrated as a win for humanity. And finally, to defend the West is to get people to understand that those in the West who spend day in and day out criticizing the West but don't have a single good thing to say about it are those who don't come from a genuine place of wanting to improve the society in which they live, but rather thirst for its destruction. Whether or not they're aware. If there are people on student visas right now who are out there defacing statues of American historical figures and stripping down American flags, should you have to take that? Because nowhere but the West would people tolerate that kind of behavior. I know that if a foreigner came into Korea and defaced historical statues, oh, I would have something to say about that. The first thing being, if you hate it so much, why are you here? But unfortunately, common sense questions like these offend those who do without. And regardless, you're not allowed to ask these questions nowadays. But it doesn't have to be this way. Denouncing this mind virus in the cultural milieu in which standing up against it will get you viciously attacked, called names, impose collateral consequences to your life, takes effort. But the more the average person stands up and says in their daily lives, in the classroom, in social settings, that this is not progress, you're wrong, and this dominant culture of our time distorts reality, I have a right to disagree and how dare you imply I'm problematic for doing so. The more you do this, the more you'll find that you're not alone. You don't have to stay silent. You too can be the power. And I'm rooting for you. By the way, thanks for watching.